people. Today, we will be talking about the Social Enneagram 9. Now, if you do not know what the Enneagram is, I already have a video breaking down the intro and pretty much all the basics of the Enneagram and even a little bit past the basic. Now, if you don't know what the instinctual variants are, then I have a full form video where I'm breaking down the instinctual variants and I also have an eight minute version where I'm breaking down the instinctual variants. So if y'all wanna check those out, y'all can definitely go ahead and do that as well. And then lastly, I have a playlist called my Enneagram Journey. The first video of that playlist will be a recording of my profiling session and pretty much like how I found out that I was an Enneagram social nine. The second video that you'll find in that playlist is going to be me pretty much breaking down how I relate to the Enneagram social nine and all of the discoveries that I had over there pretty much. And then the third video that you'll probably find over there is nine signs that you're a nine. Um, so if y'all wanna check those videos out, y'all can definitely go ahead and do so. Um, but without further ado, with all of that being said, that's gonna be a lot of like the groundwork that I'm gonna be working on in this video, where essentially I'm gonna be focusing on the social nine. So there's gonna be a very, very specific um, bend that this video is going to be taking. Um, the social nine um, is an Enneagram nine, but it's one of the three types of Enneagram nines. Um, so it's not the self-preservation and it's not the sexual nine, it's the social nine, it's the social instinct. So Enneagram social nines are essentially the people who are all about merging in with the group. And what I mean by that is that, first of all, we should recognize that the group does not mean the whole entire world. The group pretty much just means it could be a set of people that are set aside from the whole entire world, if anything. So a group could be any one of three people or more. And the social nine, because they're still a nine, so nines, if you don't know, are pretty much all about narcotizing. That's a fancy word for pretty much putting your own desires to sleep. So when you are an Enneagram nine, then instinctually what happens in order for you to avoid conflict is that when you have a desire of yours come up and then somebody else has a desire that's presented and it seems to conflict with yours, you automatically and instinctively put your desire to sleep. You narcotize it, you tranquilize it in a way so that it will not brush up against the other person's desire. And soon you start to do this so often that it becomes very easy for people to get along with you, but that's because you're not really showing up. You're just going along with everything that they do. Um, and you're pretty much doing everything in service of them. So especially as a social nine, these are gonna be the types of people that are, they want to fit in, they want to be part of the family so badly that they shrink themselves more and more and more and more just so they can fit in and be a good space within that, within that group that they're trying to merge with. So you'll probably see this a lot with many different fictional characters. And some examples could be Tarzan um, from The Legend of Tarzan. We have Stuart Little. Um, we also have Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, we have Hercules um, from the Disney movie Hercules. We have Troy Bolton from High School Musical. And then we even have Mirabel from the recent movie Encanto. That's actually gonna be the movie that we're probably gonna be focusing in on throughout this one. But to just run through these real quick, you can see this with Tarzan once again, who was pretty much born into a gorilla family and he felt like he was left out, which was is a, is a big thing for social nines. One big thing that people get mixed up when it comes to the social instinct is not, is the social instinct is about your relationship to the group. It doesn't mean that you are always going to love groups. It doesn't always mean that you are always going to be um, just someone who prefers groups or anything. It's, it's more of an awareness, your instinct about the group and your instinct an understanding herd mentality. Um, when an animal is pretty much in a herd, understanding like, okay, this happened in this side of the herd, so that means that there's some danger. Like your instinct, your instincts, your animal instincts 
of how um, a herd pretty much is going to operate toward different things and stuff like that is extra heightened. Um, and that could mean that you are even set apart from the group and you're leading the group in a way, such as like Mufasa, who I don't believe that he was a social nine, but he was a social dominant. He was most likely a social one. Um, and he was set apart from the rest of the group um, to be able to guide them. And so although he was like pretty group focused, you know, there it is. And social nines tend to be leaders of the groups that they're in because they are in so much service of the group. And so it's, it's a paradox where pretty much they're in the front lines, but then their whole identity falls and dissolves into the group because this is their way of trying to be like a part of the group. I know that, for example, me as a social nine, um, when I used to work as a server, I was so focused on making sure that I did my part, which is what social nines usually are trying to do. They're so aware of their part in the ecosystem, in their part in the community. So for me as a social nine, I was so aware of this that I always tried to do my part in like making sure like, okay, I'm making sure that I'm getting all the tables that I need to be getting and I'm making sure that, you know, I'm refilling whatever packets that need to be done. Like just whatever that any of my teammates could look at me and be like, hey, Denzel, you didn't pull your own weight. Um, I do not want that conflict with them. So I make sure to do my part and I make sure to do my part well, which is sometimes why social nine can probably be confused for a three because they're both trying to do things in an excellent way. But it's just the social nines um, willingness to do it is not necessarily to like be the best and to achieve and to have an appearance of achievement, but it's rather like, oh no, I just wanna make sure that nobody has any beef or static with me. Nobody's gonna be able to call me out like, well, Denzel didn't do his part or Denzel messed up with this or whatever, whatever. I don't want any type of blame from those who I associate myself with. I wanna make sure that they're able to look at me and even if I'm not getting any like praise or recognition, which nines aren't usually looking for that anyway. Um, so even if I'm not getting any praise or recognition, I'm also not getting the opposite criticism and, you know, just any tearing down. That's mainly what a social nine, in my opinion, is like looking for and just kind of like being accepted once again. So back to Tarzan, that's essentially what Tarzan wanted. Like he was put into this family with the gorillas and sure, you know, his mother, his new gorilla mother was like loving on him and everything. But obviously Kerchak was not having it and he just wanted to prove himself to the gorillas. And so because of that, he worked so that he could, be, he could become excellent, but not so that he could, be, could become the best gorilla just so that he could become the best gorilla, but it was so that he could be able to merge with the family and not feel like he was so left out. Um, in the same sense, when you look at Stuart Little, it's almost the same thing, like, hey, I know I'm different a little bit from you guys, but I want to be part of you guys. I'm so focused on family that, you know, I'm gonna serve, I'm gonna do whatever it takes so I can become part of you guys and then feel like, you know, like I'm part of the family over here. Hercules, same thing. Hey, I know I'm different from the other gods and the Olympians and I'm also different from, you know, the people here on earth, but I'm going to help, I'm going to do all of this so that I can, you know, just blend and merge in with you guys like once again. Um, and then the same thing with Troy Bolton, you know, he was the captain of his basketball team and everything. And then he was have he was narcotizing what he really loved and everything because his father was like asserting that onto him. And then even the rest of his uh, teammates, like they were kind of telling him, like, oh, you wanna do this, you wanna do that? And it was just like, man, what do I do? Like, should I just continue to push down what I really want to do? Or should I go after it? You know, so there was all of that going on in that way. And once again, you can just see this going like on and on. But today, like I said, we're going to be talking about Mirabo from Encanto and why I believe that she is an Enneagram social knot. So right from the jump, we see that Mirabo is singing to everybody, all the children that's pretty much in the town that are asking about her family and everything. And you can tell that Mirabel loves her family. Obviously her family is the community that she feels merged with or that she's trying to merge with, we should say. And it's not that they hate her, you know, they see her and they love her and all of that, but 
every social nine for some reason will always still feel like they're outside of the group. And that's kind of like the paradox with the social nine. They want to be a part of the group and they want to try hard. And even if everybody in the group loves them, they're still always, for whatever reason, gonna feel this perpetual, yeah, but there's something that's still just making me not really feel like 100% part of the group. And I'm still even figuring that out. Like, is this something that's literally always going to be a perpetual thing? Or is this, you know, is there a way to get around this? I'm not 100% sure. But essentially that's what, that's what the problem was with Mirabeau. She is talking about everybody in her family and she's praising them and she was just very happy for them. But as you could see throughout the whole first scene of the, like the first scene where she's singing and everything and telling, every, telling about everyone, she is keeping the focus completely off of herself. And that's another Enneagram 9 thing. It's like, oh, let's just talk about everyone else. Let's just keep the attention off of me because they're not really necessarily looking for attention. If anything, once again, they're just trying to blend in. They're just trying to like go along. If anything, that's their growth. Their growth is to go from nine to three, where they can then start showing up more. They can actually start becoming more assertive. They can actually start um, being more of a uh, of attention of an attention seeker. And it's going to be in a healthy way, of course. It's not going to be in a vain, in, in a vain way. But yeah, as, as you can see from the beginning. Mirabel was not really an attention seeker. She tried to put all the attention on her family and she was the only one in her family who does not have powers. That right away was the one thing that set her apart from the group that she felt like, okay, I'm part of this group. This is my family and I love them. I really do. And she's not even envious of them. As you watch her, if anything, she kept on suppressing. Like, oh no, well, it's fine. It's fine, you know. But she could not help but feel like things just kept on being slapped into her face that you're not really part of us. Same thing with Tarzan, like you're not really part of us. And that's the constant thing with the Enneagram social knot. Like, man, am I really part of this group? Am I really part of this group? You could be the whole leader of the team and still feel like, dang, I really probably do not feel like I'm part of y'all. I feel like I'm a, I'm a tiger among wolves, you know? Like, once you start really, like, thinking about stuff like that, then it's like, man, how do I become more like how you guys are? So, that's essentially where it started off with Mirabel. And as you continue to go through the story, like, once again, you see how she was trying to, like, help even Antonio. Um, so, she was the one who, like, as everyone was looking for Antonio and everything, then she knew that he was underneath her bed. She was able to go underneath the bed with him and they even had like a good little conversation um, and she encouraged him so that he could be braver. And then when he, it was his turn to go over to the doorknob and everything, out of everyone, then not only do people like not only do people not see what happened behind the scenes with Mirabel and Antonio, um, which is another thing about Enneagram Nines, like a lot of things that they do, especially the social nine is a lot of times behind the scenes because once again, it's not being done for recognition. Does that mean that if you do notice it, that they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, no, I'm trying to be humble. No, not really. Just because they're not seeking attention does not mean that they also don't really like the attention, um, but it's just not their motivation. So they're not gonna run away from attention either. If anything, that could be more of a self-preservation three thing. But at the same time, um, they're not gonna be trying to look for that attention as well. And that's pretty much like how Mirabel was. She just did things just because she just felt like it was her part of the group, her part of the community, her part of the family. And that's all what social nines are about. Like, this is the family that we're in. So she was involved and you know, she helped Antonio behind the scenes and everything. Um, but then not only that, they come up to the front lines and Antonio was about to go back to, uh, to he was about to try to unlock the door thing, get his powers. Um, and he held out his hand for Mirabel and he said that, I need you. And everyone pretty much like gasped because they knew that she was the one out of all of them who never got the gift. And so I guess out of everyone, you know, they were a little bit surprised. And it was, it was kind of hard to watch this too because in a way it was not only bringing back memories to Mirabel about how she's once again like the person who seemingly like messed everything up. But on top of that, her abuela 
is very perfectionistic, extremely hard on her, and extremely hard on everybody else too, but especially Mirabel. Um, telling Mirabel like countless times like to stay out of the way and I know that you're trying to help but you're only making things worse and stuff like that which obviously is one of the worst things that you can tell a social not on top of her also being an ENFJ um, I believe that if, you know in case you guys uh, don't know that Mirabel is an ENFJ uh, social nine and I think that her second instinct is self-preservation um, so that's another thing you have to know about the instinctual variants. Like, there could be a social self-preservation and then sexual, or it can be a social sexual and then self-preservation. And that also brings a little bit of flavor to how uh, how the nine is going to show up. I found it funny how at the end of her first song scene, they just kept on asking like, what about you? What about you? What about you? And because she was so much of a, oh, I'm not trying to have the attention on me, on top of the fact that she was embarrassed, of course, that she was the only one without a gift, then, yeah, she, like, it was just funny how the kids said to her, if I were you, I'd be really sad. <laughs> and on top of that, another kid pretty much said to her after she said, like, no, no, I'm not sad. I'm just happy for everyone else and everything. This is my family. Then they said, Maybe your gift is being in denial. <laughs> there was another moment where Mirabel was talking to her sister, Isabella. Um, and Isabella pretty much was the perfectionist as well, but she was all about like her image and everything. And at one point, Isabella was telling Mirabel, like, see, this is what it looks like, like to pretty much like, if you don't try so hard and to be in the way and all of that. And Mirabel said, this is called helping not trying too hard, Isla, um, Isa. And I, f I feel like that's like another big thing. Like Mirabel always just wanted to help. Everything that was coming from her was just her trying to help, just trying to have her do her part so that she can be part of the family. And sometimes when that happens, you mess things up too. There's even a part in the movie where Isla, where Mirabel says straight up, I just want to do my part like the rest of the family. Um, and she's telling them, you don't have to worry about me because I have an amazing family. Um, and it's just, it's just so interesting that she's constantly minimizing herself just so that she can be part of the family. Everything about her has to be part of the family. Um, but then at the same time, because she's minimizing herself so much so that she can blend in with the family, again, the paradox She's even a lot of times forgotten. Like she was forgotten in the picture uh, after Antonio got his uh, powers. And then they were all like, oh, let's just take a group picture. And then pretty much that's when um, Mirabel started to sing her song. And she literally said, I will stand aside as you shine, which was her way of essentially, once again, narcotizing her feelings for the rest of the group. I think that throughout the whole entire movie, we're seeing um, Mirabel grow more and more just in her narcotizing of trying to blend in with the rest of the family and eventually this starts to implode her which is again where the nine's passive aggressiveness can often come from. Eventually she even pressed Abuela because that passive aggressiveness, all of that anger that she didn't even know that she was sleeping on, that she was constantly suppressing and narcotizing, eventually blew up and she started giving um, the Abuela like a lot of her piece of her mind. Um, and she, she felt very awful about doing that, which is how nines often feel like after they've exploded. In the end, we essentially find out that even though Mirabel didn't necessarily get any powers, um, she was the one who pretty much kept the family together. They actually even presented her the doorknob after she helped everyone to build the house. She was the one who was able to bring Bruno to join the family again, um, who, by the way, you know, if y'all ever want to check out the Enneagram types for, I mean, not the Enneagram types, the Myers-Briggs types for all of the um, uh, Encanto characters, me and Susan Storm actually put together an article on that on psychologyjunkie.com. I'll put the link in the description for those of y'all who, who might want to check that out um, and are interested, like, okay, like, you know, what Myers-Briggs type was Bruno, INFJ, just in case if y'all didn't know. And then just pretty much all the other characters that were on there too. Um, but yeah, Bruno was able to be to come back out into the public, and uh, Mirabel 
although she was essentially the reason for him going back, um, for, for him running away without even knowing that she was. Um, she was the one who was able to bring him back out. She was also the one who was able to help Isabella from being able to always have to be perfect. She was the one who got Dolores, uh, a new fiance or boyfriend, however you want to call it. She was the one who was able to help Abuela to stop being so perfectionistic. She was also the one who was able to help, once again, Antonio to be able to walk up and be brave enough to go and um, open the door for his gift. All along, she was the one who was holding the family together the most, even though sometimes they felt like she was actually doing the opposite. Um, and she was the one who put back the, uh, she was the one, first of all, who identified that the house was cracking and everything like that. She was the one who also went after to find Bruno and everything. She was the one who put together the prophecy. She was the one who helped Bruno to be able to find out like, hey, what is this prophecy? Like what's going to happen? And then at the end, when she, when she helped, when she had everyone rebuild the house, then she was the one who was given the doorknob and when she put it back in, all of the powers came back and the casita was back to being magic. So essentially, this is the trope that we end up seeing. It's almost like, once again, Stuart Little, it was kind of like he brought the family closer together than they ever were. Um, Troy kind of brought the school, the whole entire school, like, you know, the drama uh, club, the science club, and the theater club closer than they might have already been. Um, and then when you look at uh, Tarzan, he brought the gorillas and the human beings like closer than how they already been. And I believe that this is why the nines are known also as like the peacemakers because they're usually the bridges between them and like other people and they tend to build these bonds. Like their fear is to lose connection, which is why they're all about merging. Um, and if they are narcotizing and if they are suppressing and pushing down who they really are in order to be able to fit in with everyone, that's not a good sign. But when they're able to show up and you can still be able to accept them and they're able to still work their magic, that's a really good operating knot. That's them moving into their three and being like, hey, this is how I feel. This is what I stand for. These are the desires that I have and I want to present them to you. I'm no longer afraid of the conflict of what my desires might be against your desires and we can find a way to be able to align them. Um, now, of course, since this is an, a coping mechanism and we all have coping mechanisms, this isn't to say that everyone, when, when they are, you know, no matter how healthy that you are, you're still going to struggle sometimes with something. And that's going to be your defense mechanism that you're going to be tempted to jerk toward. Um, but at the end of the day, the healthier that you become, the less frequently you're going to lean back on that narcotizing as consistently. And I feel like, especially as a social nine, You'll be, able, you'll be able to understand who you are in a group, why you chose the group that you chose, and how you'd be able to still be yourself and show up completely in that group um, without having to dilute who you are. So, all that being said, what are your thoughts? Do you know a social nine? Are you a social nine yourself? Um, let me know in the comments below. Um, tell me about your experience with them or being one. Um, tell me about other characters that you probably see. Um, I know that this is a kind of harder type for people to see because I think that we're not really that um, popular. Uh, so a lot of times I think that social nines will be confused for threes, especially because they are hardworking. In fact, according to Beatrice Chestnut, they work extremely hard um, right behind the self-preservation three. The only thing about social nines is that they work so hard, but not for themselves, but for everybody else pretty much like around them, which once again, you can see like with Tarzan and Mirabel, because they're working so hard to fit in, you know, and to be part of the group in a way. They could probably sometimes be confused for Enneagram twos because they are helpful, but again, Enneagram is about motivations. Anybody can be helpful, but are they being helpful so they can be loved? No, I think they do, like nines often already feel loved. Um, it's just that they are being helpful now so they can once again like fit in, so they can like keep the peace. Um, and they're unaware of whatever their desires are. Whereas like twos are often pretty aware of what their desires are. Um, I've even seen, for example, Mirabel, there's a Enneagram video out there um, where she was typed as an Enneagram four. 
Um, and although I can see how they got to that conclusion, I really disagree with it um, because the Enneagram 4's vice is envy and you know jealousy and things of that nature. And this was something that Mirabel constantly ran away from. She did not go into her feelings. She did not really try to like you know, dissolve that and everything. If anything, she just constantly narcotized and narcotized, which is almost the opposite of what an Enneagram 4 might do. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like social nines, they're probably not necessarily rare, but they, I feel like they're rarely typed properly. And so now hopefully this video is giving you more of an awareness of the Enneagram social nine. Um, look into that, check it out, figure out like, hey, maybe you might be a social nine. Um, or somebody that you know um, might be a social nine. If you know any characters, like I said, let me know what you think. Um, and yeah, done. Hey, I just wanted to briefly thank you for taking the time to watch this video, whether it was on regular speed or two times speed, whatever it was, just thank you for consuming the content. And around me, you should be able to see a few little buttons and logos for other recommended videos. Cause you know, I make good content, new ones, but then I also have some really good old content too that you should probably check out. Um, but make sure that if you really like this video, um, feel free to subscribe, to share. Um, it really helps this humble channel to expand and reach more people and ultimately help more people. So once again, thanks for watching and hope you have a great rest of your day.